get back to this a little bit. You're talking about uh, Bill Williams and everything. Just remember what happened in Spain about engineering whatever he wanted to do over there. He's got a warrant out for him, I think. I don't know for sure, but that's a good example there. The other thing is, if you guys were aware, and you probably read it in the paper, that when they chose the uh, committee to distribute the money that was in there, you know, when they chose the committee, they chose, I think it was nine people or eight people. Out of the eight people, not one was from Ashton County. Now that's a slap in the face. In other words, what they're telling us is the monies that we've expended on our ordinances and different things, you ain't going to see them. Because you know what? Leslie Kozar and that whole bunch in Iron County, they got six members on the governor's appointed committee. I think I'm right at that, right? Six, something like that. So the monies that are available to the county, I even had Jeff Burl down here talking to the Department of Revenue. And when Jeff comes to money, Jeff is super tight, believe me. And he was arguing with him back and forth. And says, well, he said, we got, you got uh, out of Washburn here, uh, the county, uh, what's his name, uh, highway committee, Ever Shields. He's from Ashton County. I said, what? He lives in Mayfield County. They didn't even know what county he was in. <laughs> that goes to show you. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say tonight, so. Yeah. All right, what's next over here? I just want to make one point understand the difference between a public servant and a politician. These people are elected public servants. They work for you. A politician works for the highest bidder. I'm Sue Radke and I just have a question. If we are going to talk about Lake Superior, why are we also not talking to Minnesota? and Michigan, and Canada, this is an international waterway, so why are we not getting uh, a greater involvement and not keeping this such a localized topic? I think, I think there's a, a great possibility with the 404C effort um, to create some synergy that goes beyond uh, just our, our little uh, bullets here. Um, <clears throat> water legacy uh, is pushing a, a cumulative wide study of the Western Great Lakes Basin, and, and I think maybe even Lake Superior, but I'll, I'll, I'll check back to the Western Great Lakes Basin. They're calling for a cumulative study to, uh, to assess the impacts of uh, extractive industry on the Big Lake. And, and we've pushed that as tribes uh, a few years back with, with Dr. Susan Hedman also. But when we did that, it was up in the Blue Book offices there uh, in Odana, we did that as a, as a discussion point uh, that was was an expanded kind of version of the, the need to assess the bad river watershed, uh, you know, from a trust responsibility standpoint because of the GTAC approach. But what I mean by, by synergy is that when when I, I talked with the, I forget the, the firm, it was, it was a lawyer from one of the environmental defense law firms that's that's active over in Minnesota, um, up in that Erie area with the big mine up there by the waters. Yeah, when I mentioned, yeah, we're going for 404 C and F, and her response was, you, you can't do that. We're, we're going to go for that. The, the region will never push and allow two in the same area. And uh, and I said, well, you're, you're thinking of this as apples to apples. and and uh, I said, our, our situation is unique in the sense that we're a sovereign tribe and we could push this primarily from a trust responsibility standpoint, um, even if we didn't mention the environmental riches of our area. And so I said, don't look at it as apples to apples because we're in a different genre there when you think about it from a treaty, treaty up standpoint. And, uh, and I've, <clears throat> I've come to understand that if that water legacy approach to, to the cumulative, we have to be very careful with that. We, I think we, this is just my opinion, and, and I'm, again, not representing GTAC or any other corporate interest, but uh, <laughs> um, we have to be careful on that cumulative impact because, to be honest, there's, there's absolutely no legislative or, or, uh, or legal enforcement team on that to do anything to protect us. It, it could be a, an assessment and a study that could run for the next 
30, 40 years with, with mining science battling real science. And, uh, and, and we just end up having a, a political manifestation of something that is a feel-good effort, trying to appease everybody, and in the meantime, we get exploded. And, and so the way I look at this is synergy, right? If you're going to assess uh, what's killing Lake Superior, the first thing you're going to probably want to understand is those resiliency factors that's keeping it alive. And, and in my opinion, that 404C, that microscopic kind of analysis, is, is, is nowhere is it better suited to be enacted than the bad river watershed when you think of those 40% of coastal wetlands. The cold water infusion component alone coming from the Pinocchies into Lake Superior is a resiliency factor uh, to climate change and, and global warming, right? Things like that make this a, a great place to get into that microscopic detail as, as, uh, as a synergizer or uh, an, an, an enhancer to that notion of a cumulative wide basin study. So that, that is one of those things that could transcend and break down these, these human constructs of, of, of state boundaries and things like that. So. <laughs> that's you know that's a long answer. I'm like, sorry. But let let me add add to that. Uh, what we know is what we don't know about the water. That's been said many times. There is very little understood about the hydrology of that range, other than it works extraordinarily well. <laughs> we know that there's 40 percent of all of Lake Superior's wetlands located up there, doing this marvelous filtering, feeding these streams and rivers, temperatures to allow the fish to spawn. We, that's where the focus has to be because there is so little scientific knowledge about what the impact will be from the mine activity until after the mine occurs and the damage is done. On my desk is a carton, a milk carton that some of you may remember from back in the 80s and it's a carton of water. It's empty today but it was cartons distributed uh, to communities all along Lakeshore communities in Minnesota back in the 80s when asbestos was found in the water supplies because reserve mining was given a permit for convenience and economics to dump 65,000 tons of taconite into Lake Superior each and every day, 365 days for almost 50 years, poisoning the lake and the water supply as a result. That was a decision made for convenience just like the company's decision to change our wetlands policy to allow them to fill wetlands, write a check, and mitigate it somewhere outside the watershed. 